Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. My name is Lisa Shoshani Anderson and I'm the lead curator at Arts and Literature Laboratory. I'm joined tonight by artists Joanne Diaz and Jason Roblando who are here to discuss their exhibition La Ruta, Walter Benjamin's Last Passage, which is currently on view at Arts and Literature Laboratory in our mezzanine gallery and will be on view until December 19th. This show has been selected as a finalist for the Dorothea Lang Paul Taylor Prize at the Center for Documentary Store Studies at Duke University. And first we'll have a artist talk by the artists and then we'll go into a live Q&A. So if you have questions at any point, please feel free to put them in the comment box. Thank you. And I'll hand it over to you, Jason and Joanne. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa, for inviting us to talk tonight. Um, and for showing our work at the Arts and Literature Laboratory. It's a really uh, a pleasure to show here. Um, tonight, we'd like to provide some context for why we were drawn to this project, uh, read some poems and look at some photos, and then answer any questions you might have. So just a little bit of context about the project. Um, I'm going to start by talking about uh, two overlapping threads that drew us to this material. The first thread is the Spanish Civil War, which occurred between 1936 and 1939. And the other thread is the life and work of Walter Benjamin. Um, the Pyrenees Mountains have always been sites, uh, a site of crossings and evasions and escapes. And those are two kinds of escapes that we're interested in in this project, the escape of Spaniards from Spain into France after the Civil War in Spain, and then Walter Benjamin's escape from France into Spain in 1940. So first, just a little bit about the Spanish Civil War. In 2017, we lived in Barcelona for five months while Joanne was the director of the study abroad, abroad, program, abroad program at her university. And if you've been to Barcelona, you know that it's very close to the border between Spain and France. And our time in Spain felt very much like a border experience, not just geographically, but politically as well. Uh, we watched the inauguration of our 45th president while in Barcelona, an inauguration that was part of a larger global movement toward authoritarianism. And during this time, we couldn't help but see the connections between our historical moment and the rise of fascism in Europe in the 1930s. Spain has its own difficult history with fascism. Yeah, so in 1936, with the support of the Nazi regime in Germany, General Francisco Franco staged a coup against a democratically elected government. And the years long civil war that ensued was a human rights catastrophe as all wars are. But this particular catastrophe garnered worldwide attention. All kinds of people from all over the world who were concerned about the rise in fascism in Spain came to fight uh, to support the Republican army. And when Franco's forces ultimately won, it led to the defeat of the Republican army. And in 1939, um, historians have suggested that as many as 500,000 Spaniards walked across the Pyrenees Mountains in the winter from Spain into France in order to escape persecution, thus creating one of the largest human rights crises of the 20th century. And I was going to do a quick share here. There you go. And this image was taken by Robert Kappa, uh, one of the founders of the Magnum Photo, uh, photo Agency, and one of the uh, you know one of the godfathers of modern photojournalism. Uh, this was one, he was one of many photographers who documented the battles of the Spanish Civil War, uh, but he also documented the aftermath. Here's one of the uh, one of Spanish refugees approaching the French border in 1939. and one of refugees talking to an old man at a camp for Spanish refugees on the beach at Angeles, Argelis sur Mer in France in 1939. And for those Spaniards who survived the journey, most died of dehydration and overexposure in refugee camps like these. And those who survived that calamity died in concentration camps scattered throughout Europe. 
those who stayed in Spain and Jared Franco's 40 plus year dictatorship. During those 40 years, Franco followed the playbook of many dictators elsewhere. He squashed dissent of any kind by murdering and humiliating his own people. And in 1975, when Frank, Franco finally died, the nation created an amnesty for all policy so that the nation could heal its wounds. And yet those wounds are still fresh for those who are searching for lost relatives who were allegedly murdered by Franco's henchmen. So in 1939, we have this enormous migration of refugees crossing the Pyrenees from France, Spain into France, right? But there were numerous exiles from elsewhere in Europe who were making the journey in the opposite direction from France into Spain in hopes of making it onto a boat that would take them to Mexico or the United States. So a year later in 1940, uh, Walter Benjamin made the arduous trek across the Pyrenees in hopes of eluding the Nazis who were set on persecuting him. Benjamin was a German Jewish intellectual who by 1940 had been living in exile for years. Uh, he was, a well, in his own lifetime, he wasn't exactly renowned. He became renowned after his death. But he was a cultural critic and philosopher who was curious about everything, about collecting, translating, archives, photography, architecture, postcards, marginalia, commodities, and really all of the technologies of modernity. And it's difficult to overstate the influence he has had on contemporary philosophers, cultural critics, essayists, and visual artists. He's most famous for his essays on culture and technology, including the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction and the Arcades Project, a compilation of quotations, fragments, and epigrammatic observations, which he referred to as the theater of all his struggles and all his ideas. So for years, Benjamin lived in exile in Paris. However, once the Germans invaded France and established the Vichy regime, he, like so many other Jewish exiles, saw that he would have to leave. Without proper papers to do so, however, he had to be smuggled out of France through the Pyrenees Mountains with the help of a woman named Lisa Fitko, who helped many refugees cross that difficult mountain pass. And her story deserves its own poetic sequence. She was an amazing person. When Walter Benjamin followed Fitko through the mountains, he carried a heavy briefcase, the contents of which have never been found, though he told Fitko that the contents were more valuable than his own life. When, after much difficulty, he made it to Port Beau, Spain, he was told that he didn't have the appropriate exit visa from France and that he would have to return to France the next day. That night, he died by suicide in his room at the Hotel Francia in Port Beau, Spain. Um, Rebecca Solnit has written a magnificent essay about Walter Benjamin's final trek, and she has said that his years in exile and his death have acquired something of the aura of legend. Aura is an interesting word there, especially for his work. So back to our time in Spain, um, early in 2017, we rented a car and spent the weekend driving along the Spanish border first to La Jonquera, which is a Catalan word for the rushes or the weeds, where we visit, vi visited a museum called the Museum of Exile. And this is a museum that's devoted to the memory of those Spaniards who um, lived in exile in the years after the Spanish Civil War. Um, and then we traveled to Port Beau, Spain, where Walter Benjamin died. And if you go to Port Beau, you can see this memorial to Walter Benjamin. That's our photo assistant, our son, who at the time was four, year, four years old. What we saw right away is that Port Beau has become a site of commemoration. It's also the end point of a pilgrimage for many admirers who have traced Walter Benjamin's final steps from France to Spain in order to arrive at this final destination. Also in Port Beau, um, artist Danny Caravan has created a powerful memorial to Walter Benjamin called Passages. Um, and also the, uh, this amazing sculptural piece, which is cut into, side, into the side of a, a cliff in a mountain 
and you're looking down the chute and you're walking down these stairs and you're all of a sudden you're uh, kind of hanging over the Bel Air Sea and, you, and it's just a multi-sensory uh, experience. It's really powerful. And also the, the Catalonian government has installed historical markers around Benjamin's life and work all along the Pyrenees. So our weekend car trip led us on a journey in which we started to meditate on Walter Benjamin and how his story relates to modern refugee crises in Europe. So here we're thinking of the thousands of African refugees on the coasts of Greece, Italy, and Spain in recent years. And also the United States, of course. And here we're thinking of our own human rights crisis on the US-Mexico border. Later that spring in 2017, um, I walked uh, the La Ruta, Walter Benjamin, and it's a challenging eight mile hike from banyul sur mer the southernmost point in France, to Port Bruce, Spain. And Joanne did the hike a year later. Though La Ruta is well marked for the most part, it was a difficult hike for us. And one can only imagine how difficult it would be to cross this terrain if one carried a heavy suitcase and were in poor health as Benjamin was. So that's where this project was coming from. Um, once we had both done the hike, uh, we wanted to think about materials and process. So when we compiled the materials for this exhibit at the Arts and Literature Laboratory, we wanted to choose materials that would emphasize the palimpsest-like quality between my words and Jay's photographs. Um, one of our friends, Carmela Ferradans, uh, recommended that we print the poems on vellum and lay the photographs underneath the poems. And this allows the words to interact with the image. And it also allows the viewer to physically engage with the poem and photograph as they lift and lower the vellum um, and read and, and just take a look. So as I looked at Jason's photographs, I couldn't help but think about the deep resonance of the Pyrenees as a border. Walter Benjamin was an excavator of sorts, a writer who was constantly digging through layers of cultural meaning in order to understand ordinary objects and phenomena. Um, so in the poems that I read tonight, you'll probably get a sense of how word and image are working together and how that excavation is working. So the first poem I'm gonna read um, is referring to this photograph that you see right now. The poem is called The Origins of a Border. And to write it, I draw upon the etymology of the word Pyrenees, which according to some linguists uh, comes from the myth of Pyrene. And she was a young girl who was seduced by Hercules. So this poem is called The Origins of a Border. Stone fruit, speechless fire. In an age of ice, Pyrene was all sweetness and heat, which Hercules took for yes. After when she felt a serpent growing inside of her, she crawled to that corset of land between what is now France and Spain to give birth then grew cold as she watched the serpent forge an indifferent curve in the snow. The mountains are the blanket with which Hercules sheltered her corpse. Once covered, she became the border itself. This, as Hercules saw it, was an act of kindness. And I took this photo on our first evening in Port Bou in February 2017, before I had actually made the trek. Uh, but I remember thinking that I wanted to create a series of dramatically dark photographs to evoke isolation and loneliness in the landscape. Now, after spending time with Joanne's poem, I imagine figures in the landscape everywhere. So um, the next poem I'm gonna read is called Seber. And uh, Cerbère is inspired by the name of a French border town. And uh, when we went in from 
Barcelona into France, you had to take the train from Barcelona to Cerber, and then you went down back into Spain to walk the hike that we walked. So the poem takes its name from that French border town, um, but the poem is also inspired by the similarity between that name Cerber and Cerberus, who is the three-headed dog that protects the underworld. Um, and I'm particularly inspired by Dante's Inferno, where we learned that Hercules dragged Cerberus around and stripped the skin on his neck. Cerber. Every guidebook claims that the town name is mere homonym, but how else to explain the smell of wet dog in the lonely station, the coast's blood red tail, the stones jutting like teeth, the pause on this frontier where mobility feels like a kind of wildness, willful, bewildered, astray. This train at the break of gauge is ancient, shredded cables, sides scoured by years of crossings, gray graffiti looping across each car as if to signal the end of all things. This place must belong to Cerberus, three-headed dog of the underworld, custodian of those souls lost to vice, its neck stripped of fur, the endless barking. This image uh, was one of several that I made at the Port Boat train station at the end of a day of trekking, um, and which was no more than a 10 minute walk from the hotel where Walter Benjamin died. And I was attracted to the quirky Renfe train phone. And I thought about connections and communication and whose voice I would have heard if I picked up the phone. Uh, and the more I spent time with the image, the more I noticed the traces of screw holes and the items that were once fastened to the cement and the intertwining of the wires. This next poem um, is an erasure of a book chapter by Rebecca Solnit, who I mentioned earlier, uh, who's written about Walter Benjamin in Storming the Gates of Paradise. Uh, so erasure is a fairly straightforward poetic constraint in which basically the poet takes a piece of any kind of material, typically non-poetic material, and you just keep erasing words until a poem starts to emerge. So this is the result of my engagement with Solnit's essay, which was one of the first pieces of writing that actually inspired us to do this project. This is called A Root in the Shape of a Question. Steep hills, tunnel, gauge track, the terminus of a foreign system. A smuggler's route over the mountains was a way out of the noose. But because of a mistake, a labyrinth of paperwork, exit visas, constantly shifting risks and rules, a heavy briefcase more important than life with papers of unknown content, unos papeles más de contenido desconocido, vanished. And this is uh, one of my favorite pairings. And I wanted to mention just a, a technical note. The day that I hiked was a hot and bright spring day. And the Pyrenees wildflowers are beautiful and colorful. Uh, but I decided to give this image a dark and foreboding tone and uh, frame the mountain in a way that felt insurmountable. Uh, the project on the whole is presented in both black and white and color, shuttling between past and present. Next poem I'm going to read is called La Jonquera, and I, meant, I mentioned earlier that that's a, a phrase that means the rushes in Catalan. And it's another one of many ancient border towns between France and Spain. Uh, we didn't know this until we went there. Um, and we realized that La Jonquera is currently home to one of the largest brothels in Europe. The majority of its prostitutes have been trafficked from all corners of Africa and Asia, usually against their will. Um, I should also mention that the poem begins with an epigraph. It's a haiku by the great Japanese poet Kobayashi Isa, translated into English by Jane Hirschfield. La Jonquera. We wander 
the roof of hell choosing blossoms. Kobayashi Isa. Up close, the rushes are so majestic, so ascendant, that they are nearly theoretical. Not so for those whose only path is exile, whose only choice is to flee and then to wait. Once, on a cold afternoon between seasons, we drove across the desolate borderland and saw a massage parlor. Then a young woman standing on the edge of the ancient and lonely road, faded blue jeans, a too light jacket, long hair flying in the hard wind, no bag or backpack, no earphones, nothing. She wasn't in a hurry, wasn't looking for a bus, just standing. A mile later, another woman, same clothes and look of disinterest or perhaps disregard. Then two more after that at precise intervals at the end of the day on this path of evasion. No other sound but wind and breath. So jo Joanne actually took this picture, <laughs> but I did not write the poem. <laughs> <laughs> But I love how the, the bend of the tall grass and the, the brooding clouds evokes the windswept hair of the women who are trapped across borders against their will. So I spelled it, Jojo. <laughs> yeah, when I saw those, when I took the hike, I knew that I, that was the only one that I knew for sure I wanted to pair that with that poem. Yeah. Um, the next poem that I'm going to read is the one that most explicitly engages with the processes and technologies of photography. And this is called Negative. At first, when I look, I can barely see the wide sky, the narrow path, the angle of the tree, the dryness of the isolation, the wildness of the border the broken stones. For me, until now, negatives have been imperfect dreams, minds yielding no gold, plastic slips of film and gelatin emulsion inverting the world into chemical winter. But that was my error. They are the heretics, the ones who choose to say no to what's easiest to see. Just as the latent becomes fixed in the darkroom, so too do I now see the image beneath this one, the resemblance between the openness of this path and the one that 80 years ago, the Spanish refugees crossed to get to France, hastily packed suitcases in hand, heavy sacks draped on shoulders, limping children in tow, dress shoes on wet feet, arms in slings, woolen jackets from the lost war, crutches and canes, abandoned trucks, empty fuel canisters, babies with the last piece of bread in their hands, the white sun on the beach, barbed wire and sand, their only grave. It's interesting how the meanings of images can change over time. In this case, it's the way the actual images presented that changed for me as Joanne did her research for her poem. I originally saw the image as a straightforward black and white image, but when Joanne was looking at my negatives on a light table, we decided that the original negative itself would be an interesting thing to engage with. And Benjamin was interested in the technical and mechanical processes of photography and how they upended a lot of assumptions about creativity and originality in Western art. And this is, the, this is the last photo and poem we'll present. And as we worked on this project, uh, we've sometimes shuffled poems around to match different photos. And this is the one uh, that I think uh, works best, uh, we, we think worked best. Um, I took this picture on a beach in Port Beau and I had in mind the beaches in the Southeastern French towns of Argelis-sur-Mer and Saint-Cyprien 
where Spanish Civil War refugees fled to before they were put in French internment camps and uh, refers back to the Kappa images where we started this evening. Um, in this poem, I do methodologically, I do what I do in almost all my poems, which I, I take a deep dive into the etymology of a simple word. In this case, it's the word send in order to align uh, ancient epics with our contemporary issues of exile. So in this case, once again, I'm returning to Virgil's Aeneid, which has, strangely enough, it's, it's been a text that I've returned to more than once for this project so far. So this poem is called Send. It is the driving impulse of a wave, a sudden plunge one feels when one receives a message the messenger himself, the godsend. It is from the Latin sentire, to feel, to be sent mentally as with the scent of the brackish sea or the bodies of exhausted men. It is a sentinel, like a constellation in the black sky. It is to consign a departed spirit to a place or condition, to deliver a blow as when the gods decide whom will be sacrificed even when the voyage has already been so desperate and uncertain. It is to utter a cry or groan, to direct a thought or look, like thoughts one has when the moon casts its pale version of light. It can be more of a glance, quick, abrupt, as when Palinaris, Aeneas's navigator, most trusted, most wise, he who had charted the water that curves around Tunis Italy and Spain saw that he would be sacrificed so that others might live. It is to send abroad, against, along, back, before, as into the country of hunger and thirst, no food or drink left for anyone. It is to be flung out of an already damaged boat, thrown away. It is to send down, as when the gods sent Palinaris down into the veil of sleep so that just as he rose to struggle against his fate, sleep flung him headlong into the clear waters, tearing away as he fell the helm and part of the stern and calling vainly on his comrades again and again, Palinaris doomed to the bottom of the sea. That's, uh... That's it for the material. Thank you so much for listening and looking. And we'd love to hear any questions or comments that uh, anyone who's tuning in might have. And uh, thank you again to the Arts and Literature Lab for hosting the exhibit. Thank you so much, Jason and Joanne, for sharing that about your project and for sharing those poems and images. And um, I guess I'll just start things off with a few questions here. And again, if you're just joining us, please feel free to, uh, to drop your comments in the chat throughout and I'll pass them on. Um, so what really initially drew you to examining the life and work of Walter Benjamin in this way? Were you both interested in his work before you lived in Barcelona and kind of how did he come to be the center of this project for the two of you? Um, I'll, I'll go first. I mean, the, uh, I think it's almost required reading during graduate school. <laughs> um, so I, I think Walter Benjamin means a lot to photographers and of course his essay of, the, uh, of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. So, um, and I didn't know what a, an influential figure he was uh, as far as his span of interests. And when I saw, um, I saw a Walter Benjamin Park on a map in Barcelona when we were there. And at that moment, I hadn't planned on doing this project. Um, I, I decided to go to the park and see, I'm like, why, <laughs> like, why is Walter Benjamin's park here? Like, what, what, what's the deal? And after like minimal research, I was like, oh, of course everyone else knows except for me that he, <laughs> he died in Spain. Um, so, uh, and when Joanne referred the Rebecca Solnit article to me, I'm like, wow, this is close. And I'd, I'd like to do this, this, uh, this hike. And, uh, and, and we eventually uh, just kind of, that, that kind of led the way. 
Uh, but, but Joanne, what, what do you have to uh, add to that? Well, uh, just one little note. Uh, there have been so many wonderful scholars that have written so beautifully about Walter Benjamin. And of course, his own writing is so beautiful and it defies categorization. It's so provocative. He, he is just, he creates these amazing observations and insights and descriptions that are so memorable and stand alone beautifully, often just on their own in a little paragraph or in a little sentence, right? Um, but he's been very inspiring to so many uh, contemporary scholars. And as you ask the question, yeah, it occurred to me that one of the, my favorite things that I've read in recent months is by James Martel, um, who wrote a piece in the Los Angeles Review of Books about why reading Walter Benjamin is so important right now. And at the beginning of the talk, I referred to Benjamin's interest in commonplaces and quotations and postcards and toys and marginalia. He just, he, he, was just, he was like a tsunami. He just absorbed everything in front of him because he just wanted to know about every object in his milieu. But in addition to that, he had some really big things to say about capitalism and about um, uh, the movement of history. And in that article by James Martel, he talks about why Benjamin matters right now. Um, when we are thinking about crises in neoliberalism and, and the threats that we've seen of it collapsing perhaps into fascism, uh, especially in the past few years. And that is what was on our mind in 2017 for sure. Um, it was frankly, it was, it was a terrifying moment. And, um, and Walter Benjamin speaking to us from a hundred years ago, there was something prophetic about that voice that we wanted to listen to and engage with. So. Well, that kind of brings to mind one of the most impactful pieces of this beautiful, complex, layered project that the two of you have created, which was for me the photo that you have of Walter Benjamin's tombstone with the quotation on it that um, I can read here. Um, there is no document of civilization which is not at the same time a document of barbarism. So it's a very impactful quote and you both chose to include it in your project, not only in visual form through the photo, but also in a poem. Can you uh, speak to it in the context of this project and of your work and you know as you touched on the the relevancy of, of the refugee and migration crisis today yeah I, I can talk briefly about that I mean it um, that is a very powerful quote and as a as a photographer it 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 makes me think about any every photo that I've taken and any Anything dealing with with progress, <laughs> you know, uh, alleged progress, um, it all kind of, uh, for me, it all kind of relates back to uh, kind of ownership and and uh, and when there's ownership, someone else isn't getting something else. So it's like this this give and take game that's been going on um, for you know uh, since the dawn of time, and. I think when when I was you know, thinking about the image of the train station and just the images of the of the screw holes, um, uh, it just made me think of what was there before that. What was there before the train? What was there before? Um, and I'm, I'm sure something had to be cleared. So I, I, I think Benjamin's interest in history and progress has really made me think big about. Um, about everything that's on my on my table, on my body, um, and any picture that I take is something related to, you know, the, the long arc of history. To speak to that long arc of history, I don't know if this answers your question, Lisa, but um, Walter Benjamin is just one of many stories that I started to engage with while thinking about these poems. Um, I, I feel like I'm doing a show and tell. Uh, Anna Seguez has a beautiful novel. This was published recent, you know, in recent years by the New York Review of Books, but it came out, I believe, in 1948. It's called Transit. It was made into a film um, that was released last year that was absolutely amazing. And she knew Walter Benjamin, and she had a very similar story to his. The reason I wanted to show the book is I just want everybody to read it because it's so incredible. It's, it's amazing, and the film is is stunning. Um, and she, in the novel, 
is doing a kind of excavation that is sim similar to what Walter ben Benjamin is doing. And she is, her character is stuck in Marseille, France, trying to get out and find passage either to Portugal or Mexico or United States, whatever, just to get out of Europe. And uh, all of the plot sort of centers around that problem in Marseille, France. And as Anna Segers um, writes the novel, she keeps thinking about the ancient um, foundations of that place as part of the Roman Empire and as a medieval place and as a sort of a place of transitory sort of migratory behavior. And I like the depth that she gave to that um, meditation. And I feel like um, that's why I referred to the ancient world as much as I do to the Spanish Civil War and Benjamin's journey in this, in this work. Yes, that was actually another question I had for you, Joanne. There's there's a multitude of references throughout your poetry um, in this project to Greco-Roman mythology, some of which you touched on when you read the poems and talked a little bit about your reason for including that. But I wondered if you could expand on that and um, how that kind of relates in your mind to the story of Walter Benjamin, which is in and of itself a, a very tragic story. It is a tragic story. Um, everything about it is so problematic because, um, and Hannah Arendt, if she wrote about this beautifully in her introduction to that book, Illuminations. And she, of course, she was um, close to Walter Benjamin and also actually related to him through marriage of a cousin. Um, but she's described how tragic his journey was because, you know, we showed that photograph of our son laying a pebble on the grave of Walter Benjamin, but his, his body isn't even there. Like they don't know where his body is. It's certainly not under that headstone. Um, it's also tragic that he crossed the Pyrenees when he did, because if he had just crossed a day or two later, um, his, he would have been able to get through with no problem because the policies that the Spanish government had with regard to exiles at that time changed just a day or two later. So, um, Every, the whole course of his life um, very likely would have been quite different um, if, if a series of circumstances uh, hadn't been there. Um, how does that relate to the Spanish Civil War? It, it's fast, I, I guess for me, what that helps me understand, it, and it's something that I don't think I fully understood before we started this project, is that um, it, it's almost like a bottleneck in Southern France, Northern Spain, but especially Southern France. I didn't know before studying this project, how many concentration camps there were in France during World War II. I also didn't know that those concentration camps in France, many of them started as detention sort of refugee centers for those Spaniards. So what happened was the Spaniards came, hundreds of thousands of them very quickly up through the Pyrenees and they had nowhere to go. There was, the, the French were not prepared for them and the French were frankly very ambivalent about having them. And um, so very hastily um, refugee camps were established for them and those eventually became some of the um, concentration camps that processed um, many, uh, many people um, during the Vichy regime. So I guess for me, just, it's a, it's a, mm, it's a particular passageway, a little geographic space that really taught me a lot and gave me a lot of insight into aspects of the lead up to World War II that I hadn't thought about before. But again, I feel like there are ripple effects in our own contemporary moment. Yes, um, and uh, I do have a book recommendation for anyone watching who wants to be more of the historical fiction. Um, Isabel Allende's book, A Long Petal of the Sea, really beautifully details the trek across the Pyrenees. So if you're interested in this subject, I would highly recommend that. But we do have a question from a viewer, which is, um, might the pictures and poetry be available in a book form at some point? If you want to publish them, <laughs> you can have them. <laughs> <laughs> it's from, from your Zoom to your publisher. Yeah, I, I, that would be wonderful. What, what, what's that phrase? Uh, from your mouth to God's ears? Yeah, sure. I'll keep that in mind. Um, that, that, that is the, that'd be wonderful. I, I, I think that is the goal. That, that is a, uh, I think it's a, it is a logical uh, home for uh, both our work. Um, in addition to the arts and literature lab. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we've been uh, just 
constantly talking about it. And, you know, I, it feels like our work is just kind of just beginning to, but um, it, it's also hard to figure out, you know, the, the, the right home, whether it be, I don't know, I don't, know, I don't want to get into it too much here, but it's like, um, we all have our favorite, each of us have our favorite publishers, respective publishers in the, in the photo world and the, and the poetry world. Um, but uh, it's kind of like Reese's, you, you put your chocolate and your peanut butter and uh, <laughs> it'll, it'll be a delicious, <laughs> delicious treat. Can't wait. Um, <laughs> but I, I hope, I think we, we certainly both hope that they will live together uh, between two covers. Wonderful. Well, um, that kind of segues into another question I have. And again, you touched on this briefly in your introduction, but I believe that this is the first collaborative project between the two of you. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your process together, how that worked, um, kind of the order of poetry, photography. I, I know that you both hiked this route at different points. Did that influence anything because you didn't experience it together? Just more about your collaborative process. So I might jump in just to speak to that. When we say collaborative, I mean, sir, it's not the same kind of collaboration as if we were both in a studio together creating the work at the same time. Um, because of practical considerations, uh, as, as you have observed, we have a small son um, and he, at the time he was four, there was no way he was gonna be able to do the hike. So Jay did it one year, I went back and did it the following year. Um, and so what that meant was Jay's creative process was in many ways completely different from mine. He had one day to, or actually he had two, two visits, one to Port Bow and then once on the hike, he had two sort of sets of circumstances in which he could create the photos very quickly. I, on the other hand, have been thinking about the hike that I took, but also looking carefully at all of his photographs and what I've been trying to do, and I think Jay said this earlier, um, you know, we kind of have been shuffling them around. So for a few months, maybe one photo will go with one poem, and then maybe we'll switch it out and try something different when I write a new poem. So my process is taking a lot longer as I draft and revise these poems. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a little bit different than if we had created the work uh, sort of in tandem or side by side. Jay, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think um, while the, uh, the shooting took place like in, in that finite period, um, but I never thought uh, the, the, the mental part of it is for me is still going on. And um, to, it, it's, it's been a pleasure to think about the photos in a way that I, I, I haven't done with other projects and, and thinking about the collaboration, think about Benjamin's work um, and having just an expansive view of his, his body of work uh, has, informed the photos and it, it, and it makes me want to take more. It makes me want to kind of go back to other sites and also challenge myself into making work about Walter Benjamin wherever we are in the world. Um, so while the, you know, the, 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 it, while the image text collaboration is, uh, while Joanne might be hard at work all the time writing, um, and it looks like I'm just kicking back, eating bonbons. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, <laughs> but the, but seriously, the, um, the, the, the images mean more, uh, and they take on new meaning um, as, uh, as the poems come out. And I'm trying to just think bigger about what what they could mean. Um, and there's a you know pretty tight edit when we submit it to either exhibits and contests. And um, that's just one little slice of the images that I have on film and on my hard drive. Um, and I think the, you know, I'm so glad that person in the comment section with one of the viewers asked about the book format uh, because that in, in and of itself is not straightforward 
and, uh, and I'm very interested in bookmaking um, and the many uh, variations and, and formats and fun um, that that could bring. Um, so, you know, I, I, uh, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Um, but as far as the collaboration goes, uh, it's been a really uh, fun challenge to not only pair the photos and the, and the poems, but even figuring out which ones to share. Um, and we will we'll, we'll edit each other's work, uh, which, is, which is, has, has been uh, both challenging and fun uh, and very rewarding. Um, so it's been, I, I don't know if, we're, if we'll do something like this again, but I'm certainly glad that we had this opportunity and uh, yeah, it, it, it's been a really great way to uh, spend time with Joanne's work, but also with get to know Walter Benjamin's uh, work, uh, more become more familiar with it. Um, we have another question from a viewer, which is that it's interesting that there is a missing body, Benjamin's body, and a missing book. Do you think poetry and photography are a way to represent what is not there? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I, when we, I started writing these poems and I was doing some of my reading, uh, there were a couple of books that I came across, one of which was a book by um, My Michael Tausick. It is called Walter Benjamin's Grave. And he has a really important question in that book where he asks, you know, what, what is it that we hope to achieve by going to this man's grave? You know, it, it's, it's not even his grave. Uh, it, when he did have a grave, he wasn't even buried under his proper name. He was buried as Benjamin Walter, which sort of Christianized his name. And there are all kinds of problems. And so what is it that we're trying to find? You know, is, is there something eth even ethically problematic about trying to do this search? And he had, uh, and, and ultimately he, you know, in his book, which I love so much, he, he decided that it is worthwhile to do this work and see if we can, can fill in the blanks in some way imaginatively. Um, th there's another book that I just started reading a couple of weeks ago. I didn't know about this book until recently. It's called Left Wing Melancholia by Enzo Traverso. I feel like this guy was reading my diary. Left Wing Melancholia, oh my God. <laughs> And it's a great book, but he also has a lot of photos of what Jay was showing of Danny Caravan's uh, sculpture pass passages and, you know, the tombstone and, you know, what is it that's bringing people to this site, even when it's a place that has more questions than answers. And I do think that that could be part of what's interesting is that this isn't merely a documentary project. And I, I shouldn't say merely as if documentary is less than, but I do feel like there are ways in which uh, in creating an ecrastic relationship between word and image, there are explorations that we can take that are not merely tied just to Walter B Benjamin's particular moment, um, but ripple across time and place. Um, so that, that is something that's been generative for us. Yeah, and it sort of reminds me of, oh, sorry, Jason, were you about to speak? No, I was just gonna say, um, as far as the, the challenge of photographing absence um, is something that, uh, it, it's difficult, but, uh, but I like the, the, the challenge of filling in this imaginative space that of, of Walter Benjamin's, uh, what he called his greatest work, and we could fill anything in that suitcase. So, like we can imagine anything, um, uh, and I, I feel like he he left it for us to kind of fill in, um, and to, to to summon photography as the uh, as a way to kind of depict that. Um, and, and his relationship to photography, I think it's a, it's a great kind of thought, uh, thought experiment. Um, so I would say, why not? <laughs> yes, um, and 
just piggybacking off of what you just said, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more and getting a little more theoretical here about uh, Benjamin's work, but he obviously had a complicated relationship in many ways with photography. Sometimes he said that photography was what caused the decline of um, the aura and and of art in many ways. And other times he, you know, he kind of contradicted himself and, and evolved his own opinion. So I wonder if you as a photographer, Jason, and obviously Joanne, if you want to uh, contribute as well, feel about doing this project so centered on Benjamin's work in a, a phot photographic mode. And if you could maybe even, if I could uh, prevail upon you to do a brief summary of, or at least your understanding of what aura meant to Benjamin to people who might be um, unfamiliar with the concept. Sure, I mean, the, I think the, uh, the challenge, well, he would say that the aura is the, uh, the kind of essence um, of, an, of an art object. And once it's reproduced, uh, the original, the original essence is diminished. Um, and as far as the, uh, the role, you know, the challenge of doing something photographically and trying to honor his, his thoughts about it, uh, that's something that we kind of go back and forth upon, uh, because, you know, I, at one point I wanted to put the photos in frames and then have the you know, the text to, to, to one side. And Joanne was like, you know what? Walter Benjamin wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have agree agreed with that. Like this, uh, uh, these things are disposable and they don't mean, mean a thing. <laughs> so so don't, don't try and, and make it uh, unique <laughs> when in fact it's, it's really not. Um, so I think that uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, kind of push and pull as far as what photography means in, you know, a, a, as an art form. Um, it's very different than uh, a handmade object like painting. And I know we can talk about like additioning or, or destroying a negative so it can, because it, it can't be uh, produced again. But uh, I think that like I, I wonder what what Walter Benjamin would have thought if uh, if he found that about digital photography and then the and then the internet, I mean his mind would have been like <laughs> would have just exploded. Um, Joanne, do you want to pick up on that? No, I, I like what you said, and and for me, you know, Benjamin's interest in material culture, material history, is what draws me to him. And his, I like what you're saying about how he had a, a number of thoughts about photography. He didn't just have one, um, but I, I enjoy when he writes about photography as a way to sort of dismantle ideas about aura in Western art and as a way to stop making um, uh, aura such a precious um, coveted thing and to dismantle that, um, that interests me a lot. And so I like what Jay is saying about how that helped us think about, at least so far, I mean, I don't know what next shape this work will take, um, but at least for this iteration of the project, having the vellum and the photograph, we know that every time someone lifts the vellum and then looks at the photograph underneath it, that does some damage to the vellum, but we don't care. You know, we just, we want it to just be, um, call attention to itself as a sort of Material a, object, so. yeah. Um, beautifully put. We have another question from a viewer, which is, Jason, do you wish you had taken some different photos once Joanne wrote the poems? Are there some that you wish you had? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, <laughs> that's my, <laughs> that's gonna be on my gravestone. Um, <laughs> the, you know, there, there are images in my head that that Joanne calls to mind, and and uh, you know, I, I wish I just I just had like this uh, a camera just taped to my 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 eye, and every time I blinked, I could record whatever I'm seeing, and um, you know, I uh, she saw different things. I mean, she saw different things on her own hike, and. That image of those uh, those those grasses, uh, you know, it, it was it was a different day, uh, different weather, and uh, and I was envious. <laughs> so um, 
certainly I, I, I wish I was, I was there and I want to go back on a, in a different season. Um, I want to go back with a different camera and uh, just experience it over and over again. Um, and that can be a very, you know, it, it's so um, seductive uh, to want to record everything and every type of light and every type of situation. And the more I learn, the more I want to take pictures and the more I want to take pictures, the more I want to learn. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it is a beautiful and vicious cycle, but it, it, it certainly keeps us going. And then there are some photos that I just haven't written the poems for yet. And, um, they are, so specific. Uh, so there are some that have swastikas with a line drawn through them, uh, you know, uh, with in Spanish saying nunca mas, or there are some white nationalist uh, French candidates that were running for office at the time that we were in Banyul sur Mer, and Jay was taking pictures of some of those campaign posters. And I don't know what to do with those yet uh, in the poems. You know, I'm still sort of cogitating on those, but. Um, it, this is still, it's, it's a work in progress for sure. Well, I'm excited to see how it develops. Mm -hmm. I was just going to mention, I mean, this, this hike is just one little portion. You know, it was like uh, you know, two or three days of Walter Benjamin's life. Um, and you know, he had lived in many cities. He lived in, 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 in Paris and Berlin and Switzerland. Uh, and I don't know if I'm going down a, a rabbit hole and trying to recreate his life in pictures, but I, I would love to see what he was stimulated by. Well, I have one final question for the two of you, unless we get another question from an audience member. And if so, please feel free to drop any questions in the comment box. Um, Joanne, you touched previously on the fact that this is not merely a documentary project. It's also very narrative. Obviously, it tells the story of, of Benjamin as he's walking through the Pyrenees and you're sort of placed in a POV perspective as a viewer when looking at these photographs because it is the same route that he took. Can you talk a little bit, both of you, I guess, in the conception of this exhibition, marrying that narrative and that documentary element? It varies. And I don't know if I can say just one thing because in fact, I'm trying to create as much variety as possible in the poems. So I mentioned earlier my erasure of Rebecca Solnit's book chapter from Storming the Gates of Paradise. I'm thinking a lot about procedure um, uh, and not, not necessarily always formal constraints, but just different kinds of constraints that relate to narrative, as you say. Um, but also go on in a different direction. So for example, one poem that I didn't read tonight is actually a cut up. Um, so it's like a surrealist cut up. And it has 13 parts because 13 was for various reasons, a symbolic resonant number for Walter Benjamin. And the poem is called The Contents of the Briefcase. And so there are 13 contents and each of them are tiny little epigrammatic um, slivers of a New York Times article that um, is describing uh, the state of Syrian refugees um, on the coast of a Greek island and all of the tensions that are surrounding their being there. And so for me, that's one of those examples of where I'm shuttling from past into present where earlier Jay said, as we know, we don't know what was in this briefcase. It's, we'll never know, maybe, we don't know. Um, but to think about the contents as a message that's speaking to us now through the work of this journalist who was talking about Syrian refugees um, was productive for me to, to meditate upon. Um, so, you know, yes, there are moments that are documentary because I'm drawing upon factual evidence and language from, from that newspaper article. But then there are, there are moments that are sort of drawing upon the narrative of his life. So it, it varies from poem to poem. And as far as uh, just the documentary nature of photography, I, I, I'd like to approach it more from, um, to be more metaphorical about it and, um, and be really loose with, uh, with, with what I am photographing and kind of step away from uh, 
from interpreting things too literally, um, much the way like like I said, you know, photographing those those beach pebbles. Um, you know, I I just had in mind the beach in France, but I was actually in Spain, and uh, not not to get too bogged down by um, by you know parsing words and 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 GPS coordinates, um, and that could be one thing, uh, you know, one other project. But but for now, um, I, I want uh, I want people to be able to kind of impose their own narratives onto it and 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 view their own. Uh, experiences, you know, imbue it with their own experiences. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think as a, I think I place myself in the documentary realm, but, uh, you know, Walker Ravens has always said, it's like, I, uh, I want to do things in a documentary style um, and art is not a document, so. Well, that is a great note to end on. Thank you both so much for joining us here for this artist talk. Uh, if you're watching, please check out the exhibition currently on view at Arts and Literature Laboratory, Jason Roblando and Joanne Diaz, La Ruta, Walter Benjamin's Last Passage. Thank you all so much for watching. Um, and that exhibition will be on display until December 19th. And a big thank you to James Cruel for doing our technology for the evening. Joanne and Jason, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much.